I wasn't known for being the most, um, uh, I was a little bit airheaded when I went to college, and my parents wouldn't send that good stuff with me. When I got down south, I walked into, uh, from, from, I grew up in Montana, when I got to Texas, I walked into NRS and saw all the bits on the wall, and I was just overwhelmed. It was like heaven for a young barrel racer. I picked out probably seven or eight new bits, bits that I'd wanted to try that were completely different from my parents' spade bits and the ported uh, larger bits. I didn't have as much luck at first. I didn't really know what I was looking for because I was out on my own trying new things. What I learned was that I needed to learn a lot more about bidding. Uh, it didn't come, uh, you know, it's not just something that you uh, pull a bit off the rack and go and use it on your horse and it usually works. It takes a lot of experience and study. So it encouraged me to do that through giving my clinics. I wanted to provide a line of bits that were consistent and had a theory and a, and a story behind them to help people hopefully pick out the right bet next time. What I found out in teaching clinics is that a lot of people don't know the basics of bidding and how horsemanship ties into it. So I'd like to give you just a, a small um, instruction tutorial on how to pick out the right bid and the theories behind that. In our culture, um, we usually break horses in a ring snaffle, meaning that when we put the bid in the horse's mouth and we pull on the rein, it's really an elementary level of of uh, communication for the horse to pull on the side of their mouth sideways or in one direction and they can understand when they're getting broke how to turn their head and that's how we break them. Of course in some, you know in California, the vaquero culture, they used to break them in the bocelles and some people still do and then they graduate into the ring snaffle. For performance horses, when we put pressure on them, we distract their mind, and sometimes we are also a little uh, less aggressive with our cues than we need to be. So when horses step up into the performance ring and we start running them, a lot of times a horse, because through the pressure and the, and the um, speed, they're powerful animals, and they have a tendency to push into the bits and get heavier mouth or have um, some de delay in reaction to their cues. What can help us to keep a softer, softer hands and a better mouth on our horses is to ride in what I call a curb bit. Any bit that has a curb chain on it is what I call a curb bit for reference. The mechanics of a curb bit, if you take any notes off this, I highly recommend remembering this ratio. Uh, the parts of the curb bit that are important are the top of the bit from where the mouthpiece attaches to the shank or to the cheek um, to where the head stall attaches. That's called the purchase. The other part of the bit, or the shank, the cheek, is called the shank. And the shank is actually the bottom part from where the mouthpiece, mouthpiece attaches to where your bit attaches. The ratio that I was referring to is the difference between the, di the length of the purchase and the length of the shank is what gives you control. Because when your shanks are hanging loose or at zero degrees, when you're not picking up on your reins, I call that zero degrees. When you pick up from zero to 45, I believe that's the area where your horse gets his first signal of your cue. A real, real well-trained or sensitive mouthed horse should give you a, a, a cue or re respond to your cue from that initial picking up on the bit before the curb chain engages. But when we put pressure or stress on a horse and his mind numbs just a little bit, we like what we have the emergency range when your curb chain engages into his chin from 45 to 90 degrees, and that's where we actually get the full reaction from your cue from the bit if a horse is under pressure. The bit companies assume, and I think this is really interesting, that you know how to adjust your curb chain and know where to place it on the bit. The curb chain always, unless there's a separate curb chain keeper, always attaches to the ring, same rings where your head stall attaches. That's very important. I see a lot of people try and attach the curb chain to the, the, a side ring off the mouthpiece, and that doesn't give you the uh, opportunity for the leverage effect to work. So we always want to attach your curb chain to where the head stall attaches, unless there's a separate keeper on the back of that ring for the curb chain. When you adjust your curb chain, it is imminent that you adjust it when you purchase a bit to the, uh, um, the two finger adjustment or one inch. So when you do the curb chain up, you, put, you pull it back and you want to only be able to fit approximately two fingers or one inch of, of space between the curb chain and your horse's jaw. What that does is allows the mechanics of the bit to work properly. So if you adjust it too long, say that there's four, a room for four of your fingers to fit between the curb chain and your horse's jaw, 
that allows the shanks to come back further before the curb chain um, engages, and it, dull, it dulls the cue or the response um, from your horse when you give him a cue. So it's very important. On the flip side, if you were to tighten the curb chain too much in the beginning, where the shanks couldn't pull back and give your horse that initial uh, ability to think before the curb chain um, pinches into his chin, then you would have, he might be a little um, irritated from it. With that being said, if you buy one bit and then you can adjust the curb chain, curb chain correctly and you find out it's a little too severe for the horse, you can lengthen the curb chain and get a little lesser or um, free him up a little bit off the cue. So there is that opportunity. For barrel racing, we use three different types of curb chains mostly. Um, this is the first one that I recommend. It's the single link curb chain. I see a lot of people using what we call the flat curb chain with leather sides. That is, uh, d will give you a, a little bit duller response to your cues for your barrel racing and for you know, other performance. Um, the single link curb chain, when you're using a horse under pressure, gives you the sharpest cue. Um, so that's what I really recommend. When we break a horse, the different types of mouthpieces that we're going to use, of course, we're going to start out with a, ring, or with a, a smooth snaffle mouthpiece in most horses. A snaffle mouthpiece is just where the, there's two um, pieces of the mouthpiece broken in the middle. Originally, we want a horse to respond off roof pressure from a snaffle. So when the snaffle torques into the roof of his mouth, he's going to respond to that by uh, coming back off the pressure. Although uh, the revolution in, in performance horses and in barrel racing, I believe, is the um, invention of the chain mouthpiece. A lot of horses want to put their head up in the air when they have torque from a snaffle mouthpiece. A lot of people put tie downs and whatever on them to make them set their heads to not get away from that. But I believe when you take the roof pressure away by putting a chain mouthpiece over their tongue that doesn't torque into the roof of their mouth, that you can t eliminate the need for a tie down in most cases because it doesn't, they're not getting that pressure there, which is sometimes irritating. Um, in 2004, I borrowed a horse called Slider. And my good horse Shadow got hurt um, prior to the NFR. Slider was trained in a ring snaffle, like I mentioned before. He hit a lot of barrels. He was really hard to ride, but he was a winner. Well, I got on him, and he was just way too much horse for me. I felt like I was going to hit a lot of barrels in the Thomas and Mac. So my husband had just a ported rope and bit in the trailer, and um, I stuck that on Slider and practiced him one day and felt like I could run him in it. And so he went from a ring snaffle to a, a long shank ported, ported bit like this one, and we won the National Finals Rodeo. What lesson that taught me was the ability to lift a horse off their front end by using a port or floating spade. Um, it didn't necessarily mean that I put the curb chain really tight and had a ton of control, but his, the reaction I got from that horse being on his front end and wanting to drop in and hit the barrels changed. When I put the port in his mouth, it elevated his front end and allowed for me to handle him and keep him from dropping into the turns, and it you know, allowed us to win. Um, so it's really important to know your mouthpieces. Uh, like I said, the chain mouthpieces are going to bring the horse's heads down and eliminate, in some cases, the need for a tie down. It will also um, provide a more focused reaction, I believe, because when a horse has his head up in the air and he's not paying attention, I think that's you know, hard for them to focus on their job. But if you have a horse that really wants to drop and get heavy into his mouthpiece, you know, the ports or the snaffles can help you. Um, different shanks. Uh, this is a longer shank bit, what I would call on a scale of 1 to 10, about a 7 or an 8 in control. That ratio, the difference between the purchase, which is the part above the mouthpiece, to the shank is what's going to give you all your, all your difference on control versus a shorter shanked bit like this one, which I would call a control level of about a 3 or a 4. A ring snaffle I would call a control level of about a 1 or a 2 because if it doesn't have a curb chain, it's your hands to your horse's mouth. Has anyone ever worried about getting their horse's mouth too heavy because they have heavy hands themselves? I feel like the key to that is probably maybe a little bit opposite of what you may think. It's all about muscle memory. For models, they ensure their faces. Um, that's the most important thing. The most valuable thing on a, on a model is their face. For a competitor, a barrel racer, your hands, it's all about your hands. If you have the best hands, the barrel racer with the best hands and the best timing is the winner. And that's because it's all about muscle memory. If you ride with good bits and plenty of control, 
subconsciously, your hands will become lighter because you know what kind of reaction you're going to get from your cue. If you ride with lighter bits, too little of bit for your horse, you're going to have to pull on your horse heavier and your reaction, if you're running home from the third barrel and you need to pull your horse up and he's not responding to the cue, you're going to get into his mouth really hard because you know what it takes to get your horse stopped so you don't get in a wreck. And so muscle memory really comes into play there. So if you have heavy hands, I highly recommend that you challenge yourself to ride with more bit. You've been riding with not enough bit. Of course, secondly, we always want to stay on the best broke, best trained horses that we can. It's a great investment for yourself. I highly recommend sending your horse out to someone else to have it you know, tr tuned up, a uh, reining horse or a cutting horse facility. A lot of times can help tune your horse up and get him better broke. But the bottom line is, if you have heavy hands, you're not riding with a strong enough bit. At first, when you put a stronger bit on, because your muscle memory may be too strong, your horse may sound or feel really sensitive to your cues. But over time, you're, you'll, be, you'll gain confidence and your hands will become lighter. Um, so I hope that's given you a few ideas about bidding and barrel horses. Now, do you have any questions? Well, I'll tell you what I do. So it seems to me that a lot of it has to do with horsemanship. So tell us a little bit about um, when you transition your horses from the, you know, the, the, the O-ring to that shorter cheek right there to this cheek. What, how do you prepare your horses for that transition? That's a, really good, that's a really good question. And there's definitely an exact timing to jump your horse up in bits. Um, I, can, I can give a general rule of thumb that our four-year-olds are going to be riding in what I call my rookie bit. Uh, my rookie bit is uh, the difference in ratio between the purchase and the shank is about a one-to-one. -one. We step our horses up in degree of difficulty. The longer the shank, the higher degree of difficulty. If you think of your kids in school, we keep the degree of difficulty low in kindergarten, and we teach them to step up and accept the degree of difficulty larger. We throw larger hurdles at them to figure out and accept as they have more schooling. So we don't want to put a long shanked bit like this one on your four-year-old horse. Uh, you're, you need to get, teach them and get them better broke if they're pushing into the bit too much at this point in their career. However, when you start running your horses, you know at five, six, and seven, that's a real critical age, when we're putting more pressure on them, stepping them up in, in, the, in the competition ring, it's important to step up. If your horse steps into a turn, pushes into his pocket, shoulders a barrel, or if he's not taking to, cow into the barrels, rating them, if he's wanting to run by and lose focus, that's when I'll step up in, in uh, control. I just spoke to a girl uh, about uh, an NFR rider that's having a little bit of trouble nailing her turns in the, in the rodeo right here. She, uh, two different riders are riding the horse and they uh, figured out that they didn't have enough control on the horse because the horse wasn't paying attention. That rider spoke softly. She cued softly, uh, more softly than the, ri the other rider that had ridden the horse previously. So to match that bid up, more bid for someone with softer cues and of course less bit for someone with stronger cues when you're in competition. But as far as stepping a horse up, teach them and train them. If they are starting bad habits, stop, reassess your situation, and of course um, you always want to stay in control, so you're stepping up. A bit like this I would use on a horse that's probably about seven or eight. A lot of times I use a bit like this on a high school horse that's getting a little stiff, shouldering into his turns. Um, these rookie bits, these short shank bits, we're going to use on the horses that have lower degree of education. They may be six or seven, but they, have less, they haven't been trained a lot. Now you might have a four or five year old that has had a lot of training, and then you can step him up to the medium shank bits and, and work your way up in degree of difficulty. When I say the shank, the difference in ratio between the purchase and the shank expands the degree of difficulty. Just right. We're uh, just to let everybody know, we're here with uh, Molly Powell with uh, Rainsman. She's ten time in, ten time NFR qualifier, and it looks like we got a question back here. Okay, I um, train a lot of quarter horses, and I decided I wanted to get a thoroughbred off the track. And I bought her as a two-year-old, and sent her off and got her broke somewhere else. Um, they broke her in just a ring snaffle. Um, and then whenever we go to train her, she freaks out when we get something stronger in her mouth. Um, she does real good to the left, but since she, I mean, she ran around the track, you know, so going to the right, she doesn't really want to turn to the right. And I can't get anything stronger in her mouth. What do you suggest? That's a really good question. And I do see that a lot at the clinics. The first thing that always comes to mind is you want to have their teeth checked. 
you know, some of these horses are throwing it at us that they need their teeth done every six months. You know, a lot of times we think, myself, I think every year about the spring I have my horse's teeth done to make sure they're ready for the summer run of rodeos. But there's the horses, I don't know if it's like the feed we're feeding them or, or, or genetics, but their teeth are getting sharp even at six months. The, the, the person, the equine dentist that you use, the person doing their teeth is very important. They need to put a good bit seat. A bit seat for your horse's teeth is the front of their molar, their back teeth, you know, the front of their rows um, need to have a little bit of curvature to them. And that's where the, when you pull back on your bit, the flesh and the, the bit pushes the flesh of their cheeks into that area. It's a little groove and it helps to not make your horse, not to pinch your horse's cheeks.